Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about supporting recovery through safe, sober, and peer-oriented housing. Joining us in our panel today are Tom Bond, Director of Programs, Helping Up Mission, Baltimore, Maryland. Sachin Campbell, Peer Support, Volunteer Coordinator, Communities for Recovery, Austin, Texas. Schroeder Stribling, Executive Director, N Street Village, Washington, D.C. Kenneth R. Wireman, Executive Director, Main Street Housing Incorporated, Baltimore, Maryland. Tom, how important is having a home in the recovery process for persons with mental and or substance use disorders? Without a stable place to live, to receive the support services, um, I think a person in recovery is, is absolutely doomed. Yeah, and Schroeder, where did the whole history, particularly for substance use disorder, where did we start out in this country in terms of housing for, for homeless? Well, we have several different approaches for homelessness, which has uh, certainly escalated in the last several decades, as we know. And some of it is shelter-based, which is for emergency situations, all the way to what Tom is talking about, which is long-term recovery housing. And that's for people who are struggling to recover from mental illness or addiction issues or both and need longer term supports in order to ultimately be self-sufficient. And um, can the, the whole issue for the mental health community really came uh, you know, uh, to headway in, I suspect it was around the early or mid 1970s when we were deinstitutionalizing a lot of the um, institutions, correct, for the mentally ill? It's very true. And I think that one of the travesties is the result of that many times was homelessness, substandard housing throughout the country, particularly on the Eastern Shore from New York down through the Maryland area. There were flop houses, there were board and care facilities that were not good at all, and there was a lot of homelessness. Sachin, what is the recovery residence concept? What is the purpose uh, and, and what is the need for recovery residences? Recovery residence, um, it's just a general term. It includes um, sober housing, sober living. It's basically a facility where um, individuals um, with uh, substance abuse conditions uh, go to and um, they have to remain abstinent from uh, from certain uh, chemical substances and uh, there's a like, high accountability. There's usually a house manager there with uh, experience um, in, in addiction who uh, there's randomized testing, there's, uh, there's uh, certain uh, different rules applied, different uh, meetings they may have to, have to go to, chores are assigned, and we're trying to um, reintegrate um, individuals into society. So it's definitely, definitely there's a need for that. And Schroeder, in terms of the recovery residence, what types of services are provided under a recovery residence? Well, at our recovery residence, which is N Street Village in Washington, D.C., we adhere to the idea of wraparound services, which are comprehensive services mm -hmm. that address everything from health, mental health, addiction support, to education and employment services. And we offer those on site because we believe that the community itself is the change agent and being able to access those services right directly in your community and alongside your peers is very important. And Tom, in terms of um, the, the, the concepts of, of the different types of housing, what is supportive housing versus the residences? Well, at, at Helping Out Mission, we, I was just marveling at the way you answered that question. It was perfect, and it's, it's so in line with what we do. We, we, we have services that run the gamut from uh, the chronically homeless, the people that are still sleeping on the streets, and we try to bring them in and get them to stop living that life uh, to a one-year program that has comprehensive services with all the services delivered on site where the men basically run the house, they cook the food, they, they wash the floors, they, it's their house and, and they support each other and, and support the house. And, and then 
after they've reached a certain level of recovery and gone back to work, that's a critical time in the recovery process where many men and women fail. We only serve men at Helping Out Mission. And so it's at that point you want the people that have, you want, you want them to practice what they've learned, use the tools that they've learned while they're going out in the community and starting to work, and they still need that supportive uh, community in order to, uh, for long-term success, we believe. And um, Ken, what kind of services does a program provide for someone who is homeless? Well, Main Street Housing doesn't particularly serve people that are homeless per se because we actually provide housing. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a little bit with the idea of the difference between um, recovery housing and supportive housing and then the differences in supportive housing because nationally in the mental health side of things uh, supportive housing is a wide gambit of what people understand supportive housing to be. Uh, Main Street Housing in particular has housing that's very independent, very lease based and really relies on the person to be accountable for their lease and the services they need in the community all the way from a model that Tom was talking about that had services attached to the housing. So supportive housing is a great step past when we talked earlier about deinstitutionalization, there were also group homes where people were kind of bound there. It was almost like a mini institution. But help me understand a little bit further. In the type of housing framework where an individual operates independently, does one get assessed at the level that they're operating uh, uh, or, or functioning at? And then it, are they referred to services that are community-based? Well, again, it depends on the kind of housing you're talking about. Supported housing, many times, that's the model. It, it's more independent than residential settings. It's based on what the person needs, on getting more independent. Uh, in the mental health world, we like to believe at Main Street Housing that people who feel they're ready and want to live independently and state that, we need to support that. And that's where it begins. The services they need are the services they need, and many times they can identify that. So there's no one who comes in and makes sure that the person is living comfortably, that they, that they have, the, that all of their needs are being met? Well, if you look at the Main Street housing model, uh, supportive accountability actually, we look at things kind of at best like a landlord with some supports involved coming in monthly, doing some coaching revolved around what it takes to have a lease, i.e. keeping your place in order, making sure you're not disturbing your neighbors and making sure you're paying rent. If you think about those critical pieces, if you're working toward your recovery, you're going to make it. If you're, if you're not having a goal with your recovery, setting up a goal about keeping your tenancy really works toward mental health. And when you talked about community, that is real community. So what other types of services are, are you providing in the Austin area, Sasha? Well, communities, communities for Recovery, we basically provide peer support services for individuals with substance abuse issues and possible co-occurring mental health conditions. We have, we're basically a community center where we have a computer lab where people can come in and look for jobs. We teach classes. Not everyone knows how to use Microsoft Word or Excel. Um, we help them with that. We get them a resume uh, on, on, up on, online. We have a career closet where people can come in and and uh, have nice uh, clothes for interviews. Um, we also have a uh, recovery cafe where people can come in and, and uh, use and, and just relax. It, it's actually a, it's a safe zone because from personal experience, I am in recovery and when I went to treatment and, and got out, I, was, I, I felt there was a lot of temptation around me. And I was in a danger zone. So I needed to find a uh, center to help me um, um, find resources and Communities for Recovery has helped me with that. We provide um, curriculum where we help link um, peers to, um, to different facilities around Austin and the greater Austin uh, uh, community where they take it to, to hospitals, treatment facilities, and um, we, we basically help bring meetings, recovery meetings. And um, so there's a, there's a lot. There's a lot of resources out there. Very good. Um, in terms of, I think you brought a very good point. Um, in terms of the types of services for the individual who is in recovery, um, Tom, what, what is it that 
you know, it's the most important aspect of, of that relationship between when the person shows up to, to receive services and once they're, they're incorporated into the program. There's, there's no magic bullet. And that's been my experience. And I've been, been in it for 12 years. And, and like Sachin, I'm also in, in recovery. And uh, it's not one size fits all. And so at, at Helping Up Mission, we, we've just explored many, many different avenues for recovery. And we do everything from, um, you know, mental, uh, mental illness, mental uh, count, health counseling and substance abuse counseling, but all the way to yoga and Tai Chi and a library and poetry and book clubs and just 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 a, a laundry list of different activities, art therapy and music therapy. I mean, there's different different strokes for different folks. And and so what we like to see is a, is a goal setting process where then uh, a man in recovery then kind of uh, picks and chooses those things that work for him because what works for one person is not going to work for the other. And then he incorporates those uh, different recovery modalities into his own personal recovery process and then, then works with it under the guidance of, uh, of uh, a peer advocate support specialist. And when we come back, I want to hear about more about your story as well as Sachin's. We'll be right back. SAMHSA has a number of programs to try to work on recovery housing and what we call permanent supportive housing, which is a model for people with mental health problems. Um, our, we do a couple of things. We have some homelessness programs that provide services specifically for people who are homeless, addressing their substance use, addressing their addiction, addressing their mental illness, but the goal being to find them a place to live that supports that recovery. Um, we also work a lot with HUD, with the Housing and Urban De uh, Development uh, Department, to try to make sure that housing units are available for, uh, low-income housing units are available for these individuals, and that the type of housing supports them as they go through that recovery process. When a person comes out of a treatment program or a person's coming out of uh, detoxification uh, and they don't have stable housing, one of the important things is to uh, get engaged in stable housing. Such uh, sober living halfway houses uh, are, exist. Um, there are more organized uh, sober environments like Oxford houses, they too exist. Um, and the person might uh, go to um, their local housing authorities to find housing. But the most important thing is stable housing, and the most important thing for a person in recovery is stable housing that will support their recovery. Recovery benefits everyone. I started my own company. I got my dad back. My friends believe in me. Daddy's home. Substance use and mental disorders can be treated. It all starts on day one. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. At times, the path to recovery from a mental and substance use disorder may be unclear. At times, the path may be rocky. At times, the path may be wandering. But laying a strong foundation with the support of others makes all the difference. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Recovery coach is um, an individual in recovery themselves who's been there. They're a peer and they know what it's like. We're not necessarily a clinician and we're not um, a sponsor. We're in the middle. We're a resource broker. We'll, we'll help 
uh, talk to um, individuals struggling with, with a certain uh, condition on their level. If you are struggling with uh, an addiction or have a mental health condition, don't give up. There is help out there. You just have to reach out. Tom, can you share with us your, your story? Because it, it seems like, you know, you're engaged in, a, in an incredible program. And I want to hear a little bit about your personal experience. Yeah, sure. The, uh, uh, the Reader's Digest version. I, 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 was, I was born in Baltimore City, raised in, in Hartford County, uh, a great upbringing. Went to, went to James Madison University in Virginia. And for me, that was, uh, that was my training ground. That's where, that's where it all really started. And uh, left school, got married, wasn't ready, failed marriage. And, and then so just a, 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 an ongoing progressive uh, battle with, uh, with drugs. I was, was able to, to land decent jobs in corporate America, but kept losing those decent jobs because of my, my progressive uh, issue with, with drugs. And um, by the year 1998, I, I actually found myself homeless. I just was destitute, living on the streets, living in an abandoned house. Uh, abandoned houses in uh, the projects of East Baltimore. Um, found myself in jail uh, numerous times, and it was in jail uh, where I learned about uh, the Helping Up mission. Um, I, I can't say that I went the first time getting out of jail. I'm a little bit hard-headed. Um, but a couple of trips in, I heard about it again and got out in 2002. And uh, did, I went to uh, Helping Up mission and engaged in the recovery process and finished the one-year program and at the end of that program um, they asked me if I wanted to stick around because they saw something in me that I didn't really realize was in there and uh, and here we are 12 years later. Very good. So the whole concept, I mean you were you were in essence referred by the courts to to the program where you currently work in right now. Uh, no, not the courts, because we're not a we're not a state supported facility. We're a, we're a, a 501c3 nonprofit Christian organization. Uh, it was just uh, talk in the cells about where where can you go to get help. So people that are that are out there living it, um, th they talk amongst themselves about where's the best place to go get help, and oftentimes that's where we get our referrals is from one addict talking to another about where to get help. But there's also um uh, shorter uh, court ordered uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. referrals, correct? Mm -hmm. We work closely with the criminal justice system in Washington, D.C., and we are an opportunity, a place of opportunity for women who are leaving jail in Washington, D.C. And one of the challenges that we've had, because we know that homelessness and uh, criminal justice involvement and addiction are closely as affiliated issues. And so we've been working to support women who are exiting jail who may not have other options so that they don't fall into long-term homelessness, so that they don't fall back into addiction or whatever other issues led them into jail. So one of the things that we've done is have our peers work with the people who are in jail and do some inreach and we've done mm -hmm. things like YouTube videos where women who are in our housing now will give a tour a virtual tour and then we can take that into jail and show the women who are there that this is an option this is a place for you to come and it's a welcoming community and we rely so heavily I mean I, I Tom's story is so beautiful because it's it, it illustrates why peers are important mm -hmm. and we rely so heavily on the 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 peers to build the community um, ev every day and every month and right. to make it anew and so they're really the ones who are doing the welcoming and the educating and the leading of the newer people and Ken, I know you wanted to talk uh, precisely about the peer support, the type of peer support that your program is engaged in. Well, I think it's interesting because for many years in the substance abuse world, peers have been involved in service delivery. And in the mental health world, that's coming into its own. And Main Street Housing is part of a larger group, One Aaron of Maryland, which is a statewide consumer organization, mental health consumer organization. And so we evolved from that organization to be a peer-run housing work organization. Um, it's critical. I, I think some of the stuff Tom was talking about, when we go into a house to inspect, it's 
inspecting as a peer, somebody that's been there, somebody that's been homeless. All of my staff have mental health issues. All, some of my staff have been to hospitals. Most go to doctors, most see their psychiatrists, social workers. So the idea is being there, it's interesting because it holds, we, we use an accountability model because many times we expect very big things from the tenants that we have and it happens, it's true. We, if I may, if I may, sorry. We, we, we also work with um, individuals in, uh, uh, with the, in the court systems. Uh, we work with, we have a program called Parents in Recovery where Communities for Recovery uh, works with, um, for instance, moms who uh, test positive for um, a chemical substance. They, they're given the option to come to our facility and uh, get a peer, uh, undergo peer recovery, uh, peer recovery coaching services provided by us, which is great because from a personal um, on a personal level, some of the best uh, help that I received were actual people that's been through what I've been through. And can you share a little bit more about your own experience? Sure. I've been in and out of the recovery world for about, I would say, 10 years. Um, it's, addiction is a really, uh, it's a hard battle. Um, for, for years, it's nothing but a downward spiral. And I've been in, uh, in and out of jails. I've been in, involved with the criminal justice system myself. And uh, nothing would make me stop. And uh, from what age, may I ask? Um, it mainly started in my twenties, uh, early twenties. Um, so a good, I'd say, a good solid eight, eight to ten were were just just nothing but um, heavy usage. And um, you know, the thing with addiction is it's it's a stigma in society. It's a, it's a stigma, and and, and um, just getting reaching out for help was was, re was really difficult. So. Um, Nothing made me stop and until finally it took a, a number of resources uh, that I had to reach out for um, and, and get. I actually went to a, a treatment facility, um, Austin Recovery. I went inpatient and um, I, I left Austin Recovery and I, I moved into um, this uh, sober house, Austin Turning Point, uh, where I would live there for a year. And now I'm, I'm, I'm the current uh, house manager there. So I've been through it, the house manager at the time, I mean, he was he was very, he was by you know by the book. We're gonna drug test you at this time. Uh, it was random drug testing, of course, but drug tests and your curfew is this this time, and and you have to do these chores and. So it's very structured. Very very structured, and it, and it saved my life. Um, there are studies that say that um, um, half the people that um, go to uh, inpatient treatment they they relapse within three months, and so. Um, that's scary. That's scary to me. And uh, they say there's other studies that say that um, usually they need uh, you need about two years of sustained um, treatment to uh, to help you stay sober. And from personal experience, it was a plethora of, of resources from Austin Turning Point to Communities for Recovery to going to meetings, talking to my sponsor, um, going into the rooms, and 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 whatnot. So you know, it's very interesting because. That's a very fortunate scenario mm -hmm. that I think you experience. Um, getting back to, to and, and other people really don't have that luxury of, of having everything self-contained and neatly packaged, correct, Tom, in, in communities? Yes, long-term programs are, I think, few and far between. There are more and more you see 28-day programs, which you know we, we kind of refer to as the turn and burn. It's just... Um, a lot of the people that we serve have 18, 20, 20, 22, uh, 25 years of, of active addiction. I had 22 years going in. 28 days isn't, isn't going to be enough for me to change those habits. Um, so a long-term program with, with comprehensive services and, and, a, and a supportive community that um, I think, and I was going to comment on Sachin's uh, comment about stigmatism. It's it's uh, it's that's a uh, that's a real problem in in the world of recovery because there there can't be that any longer, and it's a it's a disease that that needs to be treated as such and uh, respected as such in the community. And if um, if people continue to have uh, meetings in basements and back rooms and, and talk about anonymity, um, I, I don't think we're ever going to get it to the forefront of where it needs to be. Well, we've written something called Witnessing with Anonymity, mm -hmm. and uh, it's to get people to be more 
uh, forthcoming mm -hmm. about telling their story and, and being engaged. I want to go, go ahead. Yeah. May I add too to what you're saying about uh, is that I think there are some specific, gender specific issues for women. And uh, in for the women that we serve at N Street Village, we find that a, a dramatic percentage, at least two-thirds, have also been affected by trauma. Right. Mm -hmm. And that trauma, we define that relatively broadly. We ask people six questions as they enter a residence, and it's about either childhood or adult victimization of various forms. And that becomes conflated with all the other issues around addiction. With so It's sort of both causal and... Uh, They're self-medicating yeah, in many instances. Right, yeah. So I think you've made a great point. And when we come back, I want to go back to the peer run because I want to know with the whole new access to care initiatives, what's going to happen and how... You know, how are we going to handle the need for more staff and more personnel to take care of all these issues? We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Your path to recovery isn't like mine. You have your own struggles with mental health issues. Your own challenges with substance use disorders. You also have your own abilities and strengths. But when you need a hand, reach out until you find one. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression, and help was there. I found support as I rebuilt my life, piece by piece. With the help of my family and recovery support community, I'm rebuilding my life. And through recovery, I am whole again. Join, Join the, the Voices, Voices for, for recovery. recovery. It's, it's worth, worth it. it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Oxford houses are houses for people in recovery. Um, we are um, a housing option where you don't have a time limit and we don't have managers, we don't have somebody, you know, governing uh, what you do. It's, it gives people the freedom to start going out on their own, being responsible for themselves. Because the houses are run by the residents, um, it teaches the residents the responsibility of paying the rent on time, paying the bills on time, and being accountable for you know, where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing. Oxford House is a uh, self-run organization. Um, it's more, I'm gonna break it down, it's a family. It's a family of support, you know. Um, we all are recovering addicts and alcoholics, so we understand one another. You know, there's some people that you know, where they went deeper into their addiction and they didn't learn th things as simple as how to cook, you know, how to clean. Um, and we teach all those things. You learn those things, you know, how to balance your checkbook, being responsible. Living in Oxford, what I have is brothers that are around me that are all trying to achieve the same thing. We are all trying to stay clean and sober. We're all trying to live life on its terms, try to go to the next level. You know, it, it is definitely what I needed. It has helped me to be able to pay rent on time. I'm able to uh, handle my money, save. I've never saved money in my life. And here I am saving money. Here I am paying my bills on time. What was that? You know, that was never part of my life. Now it's part of my life. It's such a blessing when you got people who can pull you to the side and, you know, tell you where they've been so you don't feel all down and, 
like you're the only one that's going through what you're going through. I mean, from the big things like that to small things like my haircut now, one of the guys cut my hair and, you know, guys may take you out to lunch and um, just show you a new way of having fun and doing things. We know each other, so, you know, I can tell that I get butterflies in my stomach like when I have a craving for crack cocaine. And I can go to someone, you know, I can go to the other women in my house and they understand that, you know, because you have like two, two, two to three minutes to make a decision and it hits you, it hits you hard. And it's nice, you know, we have people there that truly understand that and can help me through that. If I wasn't accepted into the Oxford House, that means I was going back on the streets. So I'm very thankful that the Oxford House does exist. They give you a chance to prepare yourself back into the world, soberness, sobriety, they're family oriented. They, they offer so much to me and they make me feel like I'm at home. I'm accountable for a lot of things in the house, you know, and, and accountable for myself now. You know, I've been encouraged to get a job. We encourage each other to work. We encourage each other to do whatever you know, productive things to keep our organization going, to keep us going. I just want to encourage guys and girls coming out of treatment, coming off the street, that they do look deeply into the Oxford, consider it, because it is a great resource for people who are trying to really maintain their sobriety and their recovery. Half the people you wouldn't know have even used drugs or alcohol. They are the most brilliant, bright people you will ever come in contact with. I just admonish you to give this thing a chance. I have almost six years clean now, and I, I attribute that to having that safe environment. Um, you know, people that wouldn't let me sit on my rear and say, I can't do this. I, had, I was in the house with women that were like, you can do this and you will. You'll, you'll go out, you'll get a job, you'll pay your rent. I know that those strong women that I lived with are why I'm where I'm at today. So talking about the peer, Tom, can I, if I were a person in recovery and I just came up to you and said, you know, I, I want to volunteer and I want to become a peer uh, support provider, could I do that? The answer at Helping Up Mission would be no. You could certainly volunteer, but you couldn't volunteer to be a peer uh, unless uh, you can qualify with, uh, with your own personal journey. And, and what other examples of what a person needs to uh, be cognizant of or, or have a knowledge base of to be able to support someone else in, in their recovery? Right. So, so at, at helping out, one of the things we've done because we're again we're not a we're not a state supported organization. We're we're privately funded, and what we what we've done over and over and over again is just asked ourselves what's the best way to help people in recovery, and and so the the peer model kind of grew out of that for us. We didn't use that vernacular as we were developing our programs. It just was the was what worked. Uh, the guys running the house, the guys supporting each other. And now um, from our treatment model, our first level of defense, so to speak, is what, what we call a treatment coordinator, which is uh, a recovery coach, is somebody who, who has a, a minimum of one year in the recovery process, a graduate of our program who has a heart and a passion, um, has walked the walk and can empathize with men that are in the process and then help them to, uh, to, 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 to get, to set goals and, and, reach, uh, and reach their goals. Ken, in the mental health side, is it still uh, being developed or it, what it, Everywhere across the nation, it's a little bit different. Main Street Housing is part of One Our Own. One Our Own of Maryland has been working diligently on a peer certification process because there's 18 affiliated organizations throughout the state that are doing peer support. Um, and how do you get funded for that? And so getting some certification and some background in like, well, have you had wellness recovery action plan training? Have you learned trauma-informed care? Have you uh, the experience as a peer? You know, it, it's interesting because these jobs come up in the wellness recovery centers and is the person a peer? 
it's very, very, very interesting how this is all developing. And you know, at SAMHSA, we're, we, we absolutely struggled even with the definition of recovery and, and had stakeholders provide us with input and now, you know, the development of best practices, the development of principles. I think it's all leading to uh, a place where, where we can sort of standardize almost the knowledge base that one would need to have in order to provide these types of services. Would you agree? I think it's important. I think it is important because if you're working within the field, in the mental health world, and you're helping a fellow consumer, are you helping that person effectively? Are you doing what you need to be doing as a peer? I think in the addictions world, many times sobriety and what you need to do to maintain sobriety is a pretty straightforward, rigorous process. But in mental health, it's, it's a circular process that is very changing and many times needs an individual to gain some more skill. Well, in addiction, we say no wrong door right. to, mm -hmm. to sobriety. I think, I think that's the concept, correct? That, that, that is correct. I, if you don't mind, I'd like, to, I'd like to touch on the whole peer support. Um, at Communities for Recovery, we, we have uh, peer support volunteers, which are basically peers where we place them in, um, they call them H&Is, um, hospitals and institutions, mm -hmm. people in recovery. Um, personally, I, I think if you have 10 hours of sobriety, you have every right to tell somebody how to stay sober for 10 hours. That's my personal opinion. And we just, we just place these peers into these sentences to help others. We have to remember, we talk about a stigma in the substance abuse world, but that's also uh, the mental health world too. So if you're an individual with substance abuse, abuse issues and mental health issues, that's a double stigma almost, and, and it, it's, it's hard. And we also have a, um, peer recoach, a peer recovery coach program where um, we have an institute where we, we help train peer recovery coaches. Basically a peer recovery coach is not, not a clinician, but at the same time not a sponsor, kind of in the middle where um, they, they, they're like a resource, resource broker. For instance, if I come in to my peer recovery coach, hey, I, I need help to get a GED, my, my peer recovery coach will, will help direct me on how to go about that. So I think it's very essential that there is a need for peer recovery coaching programs. Schroeder, let's talk about recovery management. What do you interpret recovery management to be? And when you say recovery management, do you mean for the individual it's for the or individual. for the program? It's for the individual. Okay. More, you know, how do we manage someone's recovery? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to refer back to what all of these gentlemen are saying around peer programming because for us that's really fundamental to what we do. We also believe that you need to, at N Street Village, we embed programs that are trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive, that also can address mental health issues, and that are uh, have a gradation of structure so that when somebody first comes in the program is highly structured and then as people progress in the program it gets looser and they uh, uh, kind of expand their horizons more maybe they're now reconnecting with family members or children maybe they're starting to look for employment or work on their GED and it is we the goal is in our therapeutic community to have the peers build the community and so when you come in you have a big sister you have somebody to look to who's got some uh, recovery time uh, just as you were saying you know if it's 10 hours 10 months you know two years you've got somebody to look to somebody to work with and really the the women themselves create the community and it's sort of it, it the the ideal is that it's self generating um, the other thing is that I would say that we are very you touched on this a, a bit and I want to say because it's important to organizations like ours especially ones that aren't publicly funded is the notion about evaluating ourselves and understanding whether or not we're effective and what it means to be effective in recovery programs for either mental health or addiction issues and what for us what it means is helping people re achieve the stability that they want that they are aiming at while they're with us and so looking at uh, periods of sustained sobriety, periods of sustained mental health stability, uh, achieving 
uh, often health stability. We have a very high rates of HIV or diabetes or other correlated factors. So helping people get connected to care and get stable with those things too. And sobriety is a prerequisite? No. <laughs> It's a fuzzy world, it, but it, it's, a, it's a fuzzy world. If you would like, if you're a woman who's exiting jail or exit, coming off the streets or is homeless and you want to come to End Street Village, you have to want to be sober, but you don't have to be sober. So you'd come in and we'll surround you with the community and we'll surround you with the support services. And you can relapse and you can relapse again and maybe again, at a certain point, you won't be able to live there anymore. But we are tolerant and supportive to the extent that we can be. And it's the peers who make those decisions. True, because at Oxford Houses, I know there's almost like 1,600 or more, almost 1,700 Oxford Houses all over the United States and around the world. And, and they, one of their prerequisites is that, you know, they don't test necessarily, but they do require uh, for the members, the House members. They live very independently, but they do require sobriety. Tom, you were going to say something. Well, we, we have to talk <laughs> after this. Um, and I want to be careful about what I say, because right now, in, in, in to, in today, we are zero tolerance in the sense that if, if uh, somebody does relapse, they, they have to go. We do our, our utmost, very best uh, to refer them to somewhere and not just put them out on the street. Uh, but it does, uh, we're, we're a large program. We have 500 beds at Helping Up Mission. And uh, so it, it becomes um, a sense of, of population management. And if people think they've got to get out of jail free card, then, but we are talking about that at the leadership level right now, recognizing that we cannot continue to throw people out of treatment for doing what naturally happens in the recovery. Well, everyone, I mean, it's a relapse, you know, as you were noting. and Right. It's a process. It's not an event. And we know that and, and we feel that. And we're, so we're talking about that uh, just recently and trying to figure out how we can implement that. And, um, and it's, it's just, it's so highly individualized and the demographics are, have changed. In the 12 years I've been at Helping Up, uh, when I got there, uh, we are located in, in, in downtown Baltimore and we are 85% African American and 90% and inner city, but now we're 50% we're uh, Caucasian, 50% African American, 50% of our clients are coming from the surrounding counties. Kids at 21, 22, 24, just a whole different demographic of people out there. And when we come back, I want to give Ken an opportunity to tell us about his program and what the parameters are there as well as such. And we'll be right back. We try to hide our truths about our mental and substance use disorders from the world, and sometimes from ourselves. Saying I'm fine is a facade. By facing our problems, recovery begins, and we are empowered to speak our truth. Join the voices for recovery. Speak up, reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For those with mental or substance use disorders, what does recovery look like? It's a transformation. It's a supporting hand. It's new beginnings. When does recovery start? It starts when you ask for help and support. Join the voices for recovery. Speak up. Reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Helping Up Mission is a 
a Christian organization dating back to 1885 to uh, originally serve the homeless. And uh, along the way, we, uh, the leadership at Helping Up Mission decided, well, we need to figure out what's causing homelessness. And of course, that's uh, addiction and mental illness and poverty. Um, and over the last 15 to 20 years, what we've really done is maintain those core values of Christian spiritual concepts and values um, and then merged it with on-site uh, comprehensive clinical services. And we believe everything is God-inspired, so why not take advantage of all those different services? So we, we bring in these wonderful community partners on-site to provide uh, clinical services to the men while we're providing this, this supportive, loving, compassionate, structured community for them to thrive within. And Ken, did you want to add anything on the whole issue of um, zero tolerance or sobriety? Well, when I was hearing, the Help Me Out mission is having the same very issue that Main Street Housing is having because we have a zero tolerance for drugs. And I've been looking at this because we've been working with dual diagnosis, but when we're looking at mental health and substance abuse converging in Maryland completely into one behavioral health administration, how are we going to serve folks with more of an addictions issue, and how is that zero tolerance going to be working within our organization? So we're struggling with that as well. Uh, it's, it's an important issue that's at the table currently. Okay. Sasha. Uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, sober living. I've done it uh, personally. I'm still doing it as, as we speak. Um, I believe in it's safety in numbers. Um, there's a fellowship that, that's involved. Um, guys get to know each other. We hang out. Uh, we do morning meditation for spiritual growth. But at the same time, there's accountability. And um, we are a zero tolerance house. However, we do have um, an intensive house if people say go back out. Um, the owner of the house is uh, is very um, adamant as far as helping. Uh, he understands that relapse can happen from time to time and the intensive house houses people um, under 30 days of sobriety and we just don't want to throw anyone out into the streets because um, in recovery um, we understand that it, it's, it could be difficult and um, um, we just want to help as much as we can. So Thank you. It's a shorter, um Ken was mentioning the whole integration and with the new uh, Affordable Care Act, how is that going to impact the programs that we've been talking about? At my organization and Street Village specifically, it is not going to impact us directly because we are a privately funded organization. We have some public funding, but we do not have third party funding such as Medicaid, et, et cetera. We deliver health services through partnerships with organizations that, that do receive Medicaid, Medicare funding, but uh, we don't ourselves. And so we are raising private dollars as well as some uh, government contracts with the uh, Department of Health and Mental Health in Washington, D.C. This is, however, a big issue for homeless service programs in general, and there are opportunities to really be yielded from looking at new avenues of Medicaid reimbursement, which can cover much more than they could before. Tom, did you want to add anything? No, I was just nodding my head because we're, we're in the same situation. We're, we're privately funded, and we, we also uh, work through partnerships that, that, are, that are billing and getting reimbursed through uh, Medicaid and Medicare, um, but uh, uh, our programs are, are, are funded through private donations at this point. Now, at some point, uh, if we're going to go after other dollars to, to help boost our program and our staffing and, and deepen our services, we have, we have discussed um, the, the opportunities that are out there to get some grant dollars. And one of the things that we're, we're doing at, at, at Helping Out Mission is we're really focusing now on, on tracking and what we call, you know, we're in a theory of change model to managing to, to outcomes so that we could show, really show empirically through data, show a funder, here's how we're, we're tracking success in the recovery process. And that's very important as we get into a 
scenario where more and more we're looking at best practices and and uh, you know uh, more research uh, to to really find new ways and 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 the best possible methodologies. I think that's extremely important. Um, let's talk a little bit, Ken. I, I want to come back to you because you seem to have. Uh, a, a good sense of what's going on nationally with, you know, at least the, the mental health side of the equation. Would you talk to us what's going on perhaps in the rural, in the more rural communities? Because I think most of you are all urban based and there's still a, a tremendous need in, in rural America for these types of services. Well, I think in Maryland, we're in 11 counties throughout Maryland, and I, I love the question because in Baltimore and in some of the more urban areas, it's kind of happening. But in some of the rural areas, when we came, the, the topic of stigma we talked about earlier just hit us right in the face because not only did the community seem a little bit interested about what we were doing, but also the mental health world was saying, well, this can't happen. People with mental health issues can't live on their own independently and take care of the lease. So, not only were we looking at what we were doing for the tenants we have, but we were also doing some systems change there. And I think that that kind of activity needs to happen. When we look at best practices, I think it's interesting to make sure that we're not only looking at what's happening with the patient or the client or the consumer, whichever way you look at it, but also how that's changing what we're doing and how we're moving forward with those activities. Um, Main Street Housing is seen as a promising best practice with Mental Health Weekly a few years back and we've gotten some awards, but the idea is how does that change what the system is doing? Very interesting. Um, I want to, let's go back to that because, you know, it, it, for the people that are funded by the government in particular, are you government funded, uh, Ken? I was listening. I think it's interesting. Main Street Housing gets grants to buy our properties. We have over $6 million worth of properties throughout the state. And the from the movement, state, you get from, the money from, from the, the state. state. But the, there's this movement to social entrepreneurism so that an organization can start taking on some of its own expenses. And in our case, the tenants pay rent. So a full 50% of our operating budget is from the rents we collect. And hopefully one day that'll, that percentage will keep growing. And of course, we do get money from foundations and we do have donors throughout the state. So having people give to the organization makes the organization become more independent and more robust in the way it treats the folks we serve. This is typically American. America goes at, at a problem in so many different ways, right? Yeah. Um, and configurations. <laughs> because I know that I was mentioning Oxford Houses before and they're absolutely totally self-sustained by the by the members who participate in there. Well, it's come to the time where I call on you to give me your last thoughts. Uh, any last thoughts, Tom? The, the landscape of recovery is, is changing drastically. And um, we, we, we feel like almost everybody is touched by it at some level. You know, six degrees of separation have become one degree. Somebody's father, somebody's brother, uncle, sister is touched by it. It's, it's one of the most pervasive problems in, in America. And, and then all the problems that surround it with, with uh, emergency room visits and jails and institutions and all of that. And so there's so much help that can be provided through organizations like the ones that are provided at this table, community or community-based organizations that provide comprehensive wraparound services that are supportive and that are engaging people that are in the process themselves to help others and it's just a really beautiful thing. Very nice. Schroeder. I first of all want to appreciate what Tom just said about the issue of social costs because there's a great business case to be made for us to continue to invest in yeah. the types of programs that we have because there are yeah. so, so many public costs associated with um, addiction and mental health uh, issues and homelessness. I would say two other things. One is that we really place a critical importance on the idea of community and social connectedness. and. Uh, for our, for us at N Street Village, and for many people whom I know, that element of um, 
social connectedness, the centrality of, of spirituality have been fundamental in their own healing and their own recovery. And the other, the last thing I would say is that we all of us have to think about sustainability for organizations like ours. And this is a public sector issue too. This public sector and the nonprofit sector have to think about how, how we are going to sustain these programs in such a difficult economic environment. Yeah. Thank you. Ken. I, I love talking about recovery in such that it's not sitting on a sofa symptom free. It's an alliteration, but bottom line is symptom reduction and some of the traditional ways we looked at things in the past aren't going to work anymore. You have to have a goal. You have to be a part of the community. You have to really put something in front of yourself to say, okay, I'm going to recover to this. Um, Main Street Housing at best provides a platform. Somebody becomes a tenant, somebody becomes a member of society, somebody becomes a neighbor, and it isn't a group home, and it isn't a residential setting. So that kind of activity is where we need to go. Thank you. Sachin. Thank you. Yvette, I want to thank you for having us here today. Uh, thank, thank you to all of my, my fellow panelists. I really appreciate it. Um, Communities for Recovery, we are a nonprofit organization, but we also have private donors, and we also uh, receive grants from a wonderful organization called SAMHSA, um, so thank you there. Um, we, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, we are, um, the addiction world, the mental health world, it's, it's, it could be a juggernaut at times. Um, it's always changing, and I mentioned there was a double s stigma in society, but it's getting better. And if anyone's watching this, um, going through uh, issues with addiction or mental health, just don't give up. There's plenty of resources out there, and um, just never give up, and there's help out there. And I, I just want to just let people know from personal experience, I, I, I and, and, and Tom also, we, are, we, we represent change, that we, 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 are, we, we, are, we can change for the better. Excellent. And I want to remind our audience, uh, first of all, our panel, that we're trying to move away from the word of stigma and call it discrimination. That's go. one That's one idea <laughs> that our, our colleagues at SAMHSA are trying to put forward. But that September is Recovery Month, and we hope that everyone who is uh, in our audience uh, thus uh, get engaged and visit recoverymonth.gov because it merits your attention and it merits your participation through events and activities. And, and what a better time to get engaged and talk about issues of homelessness uh, in, here in America. And I want to thank you for being here. It's been a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.